welcome uh, you uh, for this uh, specific Kaya talk dedicated to the, let's say, the sport industry and more specifically the F1. So let me introduce you, well, normally we introduce the lady, but I would like to introduce also uh, the interviewer first, Philippe. Philippe Arzheim is a current student of the Master in uh, Sport Business Management at IOM, and he accepted to be the Master of Ceremony for this interview. And, and uh, he will um, uh, perform this uh, interview uh, of Desislava Pesheva, a fantastic alumna, uh, 2017 already, uh, from the Master in Sport Business Management, uh, who started a fantastic career in, uh, in, uh, in, in Formula E, Formula One, but in a few minutes, answering all the questions from, uh, uh, from Philippe and, of course, the audience. At the end, if you have questions, guys, this is Lava will explain a career path and will answer all the questions. So I don't want to spend more time. It's the stage is yours, Philippe and this is Lava. And big thanks to, uh, to, accept, it, uh, to accept this, uh, this career talk tonight together. Thank you very much. Please, Philippe. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to have you uh, here today, Daisy. Um, let's dive directly in. Um, why did you choose this career path that you did? Uh, thanks, Philip. First, before starting with myself, I want to say one big thank you to the uh, International University of Monaco, of Marjorie and her team, you know, for organizing this. I believe that it's going to be very beneficial for all the students. Uh, so I actually chose this path. Uh, well, um, I'm a former athlete. I was a former gymnast. So basically sport is in my blood and it was actually very normal for me, you know, to continue an education in, in this direction. And really, um, I saw a lot of development, my personal and uh, professional development to be particularly in uh, sport marketing. Okay, that sounds interesting. Um, regarding your start into the professional world, um, what were your first steps to enter the motorsport industry? Uh, well, again, here is the big influence of the university and of course Marjorie. Uh, how it all started after our program uh, in International University of Monaco, all of the students uh, have uh, choices what to do after the program, if it's going to be an internship or, you know, to do some kind of a research on the program that they are uh, studying. So in my case, I just chose uh, to follow with an internship and I had a very exciting opportunity to start with uh, Venturi Racing in Formula E. Uh, so it's a, it is how actually everything started and again great great experience and great opportunity just to start a path in the motorsport industry. You worked also for Williams Racing and could you explain what your task or responsibilities were while you were working as a commercial manager? Uh, yes, of course. So as you can imagine in Formula One everything is very expensive. It is very expensive to run a team. Uh, so being in the commercial department, uh, I was working to find a new partners for the team. I was, um, um, you know, involved in all the discussions to find a new revenue streams. Uh, so it's going to help specifically for Williams Racing, which is the only one independent team in Formula One, a team which uh, doesn't manufacture any, anything, you know, to go and to, to, to drive any kind of a different commercial uh, streams for the team. So it was very important for us, you know, to be very proactive and to find uh, something new, new partners which are going to support, uh, you know, the team to go back uh, on the top in Formula One. Amazing. Sounds really great. Hardworking. And yeah, but now it seems that you moved into a different direction. Um, what are you, where are you working now and what is the purpose of your company and your position? Maybe you can also share three important skills to have for your workplace. Yeah, absolutely. So still I'm in uh, motorsport, uh, but now I'm in a sports and entertaining agency called Right Formula. Uh, my responsibility is again, it's uh, to find this kind of a commercial partnerships conversation and to connect brand with uh, different uh, right holder in, uh, within the motorsport. Um, the very exciting thing for me here is that I'm open to communicate with every Formula One and every Formula E team. Uh, 
uh, which is great because, you know, again, from a professional development uh, and experience, it's great just to have this big scope of conversations, communication, networking. Uh, so, yeah, on, on this stage, on my personal development stage and professional, I think it's, it is very beneficial and very good cho choice that, I, that I've done last year. Um, and still, still, I'm very closely related to, you know, to motorsport, F1 and Formula E. And how did you perceive working in a more male dominated industry uh, that motorsport is? Did you face any difficulties? Um, can you maybe describe most demanding tasks that you that can occur? Uh, yeah, sure. So yeah, I know that probably motorsport is seen as a male dominated industry. Uh, but for, for all of the ladies, all of the girls, uh, if there are somebody who is uh, listening um, this kind of an interview, this kind of a session, I would say that specifically last year with the start of the pandemic, uh, with the Black, um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, that started, everything changed. And uh, there is a very big push for diversity, for equality in motorsport, but not only in motorsport, in every, every, every different sport, this is a very, very big push because sport got to be used as a platform for equal opportunities. Um, so even in, in, in motorsport, we can see this uh, again in Formula E. Uh, with Vetturi Racing, with Suzy Wolf, who is the only team, uh, only female team principal right now running a motorsport team. In the past, we saw it with Claire Williams, who was the team principal of uh, Williams Racing. Um, so really, to be honest with you, in motorsport, there is a very big push, uh, females to be involved on different levels. If it's going to be managerial, if it's going to be commercial, if it's going to be an engineering side, it's a very, very big push. And to be honest with you, I, I really see that more and more girls are involved in, in the motorsport industry. That's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we heard a lot of interesting and inspirational answers about your professional career now. Um, but we wanted also to talk about um, the topic rethinking Formula One assets to engage customers globally. Could you first of maybe explain what assets a Formula One team has? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so, of course, when we're talking about activation and engagement with the consumer, with the fan, what is more important in Formula One probably was said the drivers, of course. Uh, something else that we have is uh, senior people like team principals, very well recognized people, let's say like Toto Wolf. Um, the other thing that we have and is very important nowadays, again, uh, very pushed during the pandemic, uh, assets that came up front, it is the digital assets, dig digital activation, digital content, esports became very popular and very useful for all of the different rights holders. And the third very big thing that is also very closely related to the fans, this is so any kind of a merchandising gifting that, uh, again, they can keep it as a souvenir and to keep it close in their kind of a relationship with the team that they like. Okay, and considering those assets that are already there, which assets has Formula One to contemplate in the future to better engage with the customers? Well, I think that in the last two years, Formula One did a lot, uh, specifically with the change of the management. Uh, they saw that they got to do much more uh, specifically to give uh, bigger access to the fans, to interact with the sport, the sport to become more affordable, more people to have access to the drivers, to the teams. Um, again, the digital aspects grow a lot. Uh, I don't know if some of, uh, of again, some of the listeners uh, are following, you know, some stats or reports around Formula One. Uh, but last year, Formula One is the fastest growing digital sport with the biggest digital activation and engagement. Uh, so it's, it is just show how much, you know, the organization um, does, you know, to interact and really to lead the sport and to make it accessible as much as possible. Um, talking what they got to change, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that something got to be changed. Of course, everything is going to evolve uh, with, the evo uh, with the evolving of technology, of innovation. Um, so it is, it is just, just, just um, a question uh, where the technology and how the technology is going to boost the boundaries of this kind of uh, fan engagement uh, process. And what would you suggest as further tactic tactics? to engage existing or even new fans more with the low overlap sports like Formula One? 
Uh, so probably the first thing uh, which I know that uh, will happen, uh, there is a big talks uh, that the broadcasting a uh, little bit is going to change. Uh, what does it mean that there will be a drone uh, broadcasting? So basically seeing the cars from the top. Uh, so you can see the overtakes, you can see when there is a battle between the drivers, you know, to have this kind of a bird eye. Uh, so this is one of the things. The other things uh, is going to be behind the scenes content, which is going to be provided to the wider audience. Uh, probably some of you saw Drive to Survive in Netflix. Great series presenting the story of the drivers, you know, all of their difficulties as a human beings, how they have to perform every day, you know, to keep their places because it's very competitive uh, environment. Um, um, Esports again is growing a lot. Uh, this is something that Formula One uh, did specifically to get in touch with the grassroots of the sport to develop this kind of a uh, um, uh, ladder of a progression of a driver. But again, this is this is um, to make the sport more affordable. To show that even you coming from not such a rich or you know a rich background, again with a lot of effort, with a lot of work, you can actually take a seat one day in a Formula One car. Um, so again, the sport evolves a lot, a lot of digital, a lot of technology, a lot of innovation is involved in it. So it's yeah, just a question of time to see uh, what the sport is going to bring us in the future. Some sports don't give you the same coverage at the event than what you receive watching it on a TV. Given this, you still want to attract fans to the event while ensuring those that are not at the event still have a good experience. How do you balance the on-site fan experience and that of the fan at home? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, so again, I believe that during the pandemic was uh, the biggest challenge for all of the sports uh, right holders to manage uh, the expectation of their fans and of course to interact and to engage with them because uh, the most important thing for every sport is their fan base, right? Um, so talking about the pandemic, talking about people that probably are not able to attend a, a race, a sport, a sport event, uh, what is the most important? Again, it is going to be the digital interaction, the content that you provide, uh, something that is going to be easy to access, easy to watch, easy to understand. Um, so, again, I believe that the sport did a lot last year in this respect, um, thinking about uh, attaining an event. Of course, uh, there is nothing better than uh, watching Formula One uh, live, <laughs> I believe, especially in Monaco. Uh, so, uh, for all of the students, uh, you know, I believe that some of you are going to have the chance to participate this year. Formula E and Formula One are taking place in Monaco. It is a great atmosphere. Uh, the local organizers L'Automobile uh, Mobile Club de Monaco are doing a great job, but they're doing a lot of interactions for, for the visitors of the municipality. Uh, there is a lot of entertainment. They're trying to mix entertainment with sport, which is great. Uh, again, um, this access to the pit lanes, uh, to have the chance, you know, to walk on the racetrack where actually the, the, the race is going to take place. It is... Um, it is something great, and also uh, from my from my memories, Marjorie. You know, when when I work with uh, with the club, uh, we have also the chance, you know, for all of the audience, you know, on Plus Durham to to come to see the drivers, to ask questions, even to take merchandises because they were trolling caps or something else. So again, it's a great interaction. I mean, for every big fan just seeing uh, their favorite driver, ask him a question. This is this is like a memory for life. Um, so again, it's it is really to manage the expectations of everybody and to cover you know all of, all of their needs. But I, I think that the sport the sport is doing very well in in this respect. This is super interesting. I really look forward <laughs> to uh, seeing the Monaco Grand Prix. Yeah, well, yeah. It would be amazing. Um, yeah, since you started <laughs> in motorsport, did you see any notable changes in terms of fan engagement? Uh, yes, uh, but this is more like uh, the insights, the data behind it. Uh, so motorsport itself uh, wasn't run like to, uh, to collect so much uh, CRM data about their fans, uh, which is very important. We, we, we have that in predominantly in soccer, but in motorsport wasn't so well developed. Now the teams realize how important for them is to have data about their fans, to know who are their fan base, to who they talk, how to talk, what to, what to launch, what content is going to be engaging for them. 
so it is a very big push, not only for the teams, but for the organization itself. A lot of data is collected about the persona of the Formula One fan. And this is, this is a very big change that, uh, you know, it's growing and it is going to grow in the future because even talking about from a commercial side, talking to a brand, brand is coming to you to access in an easy way. Um, they are targeted customer using a sports platform, which is uh, like a unique way to promote a product, showcase a technology, uh, increase your network. So all of these data, all of these insights are really, really important when you are talking about activation or, uh, again, some kind of an interaction with your fan base. And regarding this, what would you say the next five years hold for the sports fan in terms of innovation? Uh, hydrogen engine, for sure. <laughs> I believe that uh, yeah, this will be the, the biggest uh, uh, tech um, integration in a Formula One car. As I know in Dumont, they are going to test the first uh, hydrogen engine uh, this year. Uh, so we'll see you know, in five years time if uh, this is going to be introduced in Formula One. Um, another big push uh, for the organization itself is uh, sustainability. The sport is going to talk and is going to launch much more content talking about their sustainability credentials because um, as probably all of you know or have the perception that Formula One is uh, like very exclusive, very expensive sport. Actually, it is, it is how they want to change this perception. Um, nobody knows about all of the R&D research and development that is going behind the scene. Um, again, last year during the pandemic, Williams Racing, McLaren, they helped to create um, devices that were helping people to, to breathe in the hospitals. And again, this is all of the technology and innovations that is happening behind the scenes. And it's all of this um, technology that uh, is taking place, is taking integrations within other industries that is driving them to be efficient, to be sustainable. Uh, so it's what uh, the sport is going to evolve and it's how, again, from a customer perspective, like new partners to come on board because it is how they're going to drive their uh, sustainability credentials or it's going to help them, you know, to become more sustainable. But on the other side, specifically for the young generation, what we are seeing that young people are uh, sustainability cautious. They're interested to protect, uh, to protect the environment. They're interested or very cautious from what brand they're going to buy a product, if they're sustainable, if not, if they harm the environment, do they recycle or not? Um, so that's why, again, from, uh, from a fan, fan engagement point of view, this is going to be a very, very big topic and a very big uh, tick in the box, if you have it or not, as a sport property. Uh, and as a sport platform, um, so yeah, this is this is coming this is coming in the in the next five years, and also the sport itself has its own strategy by 2032 become uh, carbon neutral. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But uh, again, a lot of changes, and uh, tech and innovation will play a big part in in this uh, kind of um, development of the sport. Yeah. Also regarding the sustainability aspect and what do you think about Formula E in general and do you perceive Formula E as a major competitor of the Formula One? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Formula, Formula E, uh, how it was created as a sport uh, was basically to promote uh, e-mobility and renewable energy. Uh, so it is a purposely created sport. Uh, it is a very young sport, but even though it's, uh, it's growing very fast, it is a sport which is created predominantly for the young generation, a uh, generation uh, uh, which is interested again in uh, sustainability credentials, with new technology, uh, people predominantly who are living in the city centers in a big cities, because as you know, Formula is taking place in the, in the city centers. Uh, it, you don't need a specific venue to, to run the races. Um, big competitors, uh, yes, because Formula E very successfully uh, are messaging, communicating uh, their platform, why they exist, that they have a purpose, what is their DNA, while uh, Formula One just, um, you know, probably step a little bit behind uh, with this, with this sense. Uh, just because the story about all of this uh, tech integration that I was talking about, still some people don't know it, don't recognize it. Um, that's why in the future will be very interesting, you know, how the two sport organizations are going to run the series and how they're going to challenge themselves because in these challenges, actually the two entities are going to grow. 
Um, so yeah, totally a question, question of time, and we'll see what is happening. Of course, we have in Extreme E uh, launch uh, this year, uh, which again is another uh, electrification series. Uh, so yeah, just just a question of time, what will happen? Okay, that brings me to my final question. Um, after that, we go to the question and answer from the audience. And um, which points or aspects do you want our audience to take from our career talk? Sorry, could you please repeat? Yeah. Um, which point or aspect do you want our audience to take from our career talk? Which point? Um, so basically, uh, from my experience, guys, I don't know, but uh, just just use your time uh, in Monaco with uh, the International University of Monaco as much as you can. Uh, take all of the network, take all of the connections, use your teachers, your professors. They are great people. They are going to support you in everything. So really, nowadays, business is run on communication and relationship. Uh, so just 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 take your time, be proactive, be positive, and just work hard. And you know the success uh, eventually is gonna happen. You know at the end of the day, it's all about a little bit of luck. But uh, if you're consistent, if you believe in what you're doing, if you really want to achieve your goal, it's gonna happen. Okay, thank you very much. So far, um, I got a question from the audience because last year there's a huge difference between teams. How will F1 2023 salary cap will work? Uh, yes, <laughs> great question. Uh, so the financial cap uh, is going to take place uh, very soon. This is because uh, Formula One wants to um, uh, evolve the competition between the between the between the teams. As, as you know, you know, some of the teams are small, some of the teams doesn't have the financial capacity to invest in the, the, the development of the car. That is why this financial cap is so important for the small teams to be equal with the big teams like uh, McLaren, like uh, Red Bull, like Mercedes, because like that we are going to improve the competition and uh, it is like how that we're going to improve also the, the challenging between the teams and it's how also for from a fan, fan point of view, you know, it's going to be much more interesting to watch a race, not just to watch one dominant team uh, being on the top and, you know, during the whole race uh, and winning every time. Uh, so, yeah, this is this is the reason of the financial cap. It is just to improve the competition, uh, the, the competitiveness of the teams and really to drive the sport to, to evolve. Another question would be, what do I, can you, suggest to students to find uh, opportunities in this sector? Um, there are a lot of opportunities in the sector. It depends what uh, you're really uh, looking for. Um, so uh, commercial marketing, communication, PR, uh, based on what we're studying in the International University of Monaco, of course, management, uh, business strategy, uh, finance, uh, very big and important, uh, department, you know, segment department of, of a team of our organization. So ev everything is open in this industry. Absolutely everything is open. Also, what would you tell your younger self before joining IUM? Uh, myself, I was very afraid, to be honest. <laughs> I was very afraid, yeah, because uh, I did my bachelor in my home country, and uh, when I went to France, to Monaco, I was by myself, uh, living alone, didn't know anybody. Uh, but again, uh, with the support of the, of the, of the school, of the support of, the, of our teachers, uh, just uh, everything uh, happened. So again, you got to take the chance, you got to risk a little bit and just, you know, sometimes just follow the flow and to, to see what is going to happen. What helped you the most during your master at IUM in order to join Formula One? Oh, uh, I don't know. I really enjoyed my courses in sports marketing um, with Mr. Pons. It was great. Um, we have also a sport management with Beverly. Uh, great, great experience again. Um, so again, it is a question of what's your personality and uh, what you're pursuing as a career, where you see yourself in the future on a position, if it's going to be commercial, if it's going to be a marketing, if it's going to be a managerial position. 
uh, but I would say that the course was great. It was very like um, professionally integrated, you know, with a lot of uh, some kind of a takeaways that you can use in your professional life. You have the academic, but you also have like the, the activities just really to, to, to use your time there and to, to, to experience, you know, your knowledge. And what do you think IUM and Monaco bring you more than other business schools? Uh, network. Network, uh, international place, uh, you're absolutely able to communicate with different people in different languages, different cultures. It is uh, what is so important in sport. You know, in sport, you are going to meet so many different people from so many different places. So just being open to understand differences, uh, to understand culture, to know how to behave, to know what to say, to know how to communicate. It's so important because nowadays everything is negotiation. Everything is communication. Um, Monaco as it plays also is very safe, uh, very small, very protective. Um, very nice weather and location <laughs> we shouldn't forget uh, but again everything is about the people i can say it's um, it's really great opportunity and uh, especially marjorie you know she's pushing so much for her students we had the chance to visit uh, ferrari the ferrari factory in maranello to interact with their uh, commercial marketing team later to have a uh, opportunity and experience with the uh, automobile club de monaco to participate in the organization of formula e or formula one uh, to partici participate on um, a Mon Mon Monte Carlo tennis uh, tournament. It is just amazing. I mean, you cannot get this anywhere else. I mean, Monaco is a sport destination. So many sports are happening around the area. Um, and, and again, you just got to meet the people. They got to know you. They, they got to just, uh, you know, to, to, to understand you as a person. And it's how, how nowadays you are, you know, getting sometimes um, a job, a uh, job, uh, particular you know position because it's sometimes also your personality is selling you probably it's, it, it's sounding very bad but uh, um, you know everybody has the knowledge nowadays everybody has the access to the data to google to internet everybody can take everything that you need but it's just you know to show this passion that you really wants to be there and this dedication to evolve to educate to to learn more and to listen from more experienced people so I don't know. I, I had a great time. I, I'm very, you know, big thank you to Marjorie, to the International University of Monaco. I'm where I am just because uh, choosing uh, this, this university and this part of development. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Desi Slama. I think we have time for last questions, maybe, Philippe. And, and I think it will be already the time to, uh, to leave. Uh, please, Philippe. Okay, the last question is for Formula One. Um, do you think the Mercedes dominance will go away after the 2020 regulations? I hope so. I really hope so. Uh, I really uh, hope that there will be more competition, more overtakes, uh, even the smaller teams, you know, to fight for the, the first three positions. So yeah, let's see, let's see. A lot, of, a lot is going on behind the scenes uh, with every team. So let's see what is there going to show us on the track. All right, thank you. That was, was a pleasure talking to you, Daisy. And yeah, to me too. A lot of insight. And thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Philippe and Daisy, for sharing your passion. And if I can say something, well, first, thank you very much because you mentioned a lot IOM and my name, so I appreciate a lot. But uh, guys, also, you know, of course, we, we propose and we help students. But first, you have to be driven by a dream. And uh, it was the case of Desi Slava. She, she had a dream and she wanted really to achieve it and she managed to do it. And uh, Philippe, I really hope that in a few years you will be the interviewed as well, you know. And uh, well, I think uh, we could continue to talk for uh, hours, but I'm pretty sure we'll have other occasion later. A big thank Desi Slava because I know you're super busy, Philippe, for your engagement as usual. And thank you guys, everybody. And uh, well, well, if you want to contact me or to, to contact IOM to continue the discussion, please. Uh, I really hope you will uh, take care. Everybody take care because uh, it's crazy time now and uh, have an extremely good evening. Thank you so much, guys, for this Thank talk. you. Thank you, Marjorie. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Let's keep in touch. Thank you. <laughs>